How do you account for the errors of the scribes um, when the New Testament was handed down person to person? Yeah, excellent question. There are errors that we know about. Why? Because we can compare the documents, we can compare the manuscripts and see where the errors are. In fact, let me see if I can show you a representation of that because it's better seen uh, than it is described. Is the Bible that we have today accurate? This question has become increasingly popular due to writings from skeptics like Bart Ehrman, and you'll see how the student featured in this particular Q&A, Grace is her name, you'll see how her thinking about the reliability of the New Testament has been affected. But there's also a huge bomb that gets dropped during the answer in this Q&A that is extremely important. With that being said, let's dive in. Let's say you have, here's the original, which we don't have. We don't, at least we, we we don't think we have any original documents, okay? So they're all copies, okay? Uh, and let's say you find four different copies. And in the first copy, you see an error right here. And then uh, another copy, there's another error right there. In the third copy, there's another error right there. And in the fourth copy, there's an error right there. Can you reconstruct the original? Yes. Yes. And that's what scholars do. The original, this happens to be Romans, Romans 3.26, God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now the note here is the New Testament documents have far fewer variations than this example. So yes, sometimes scribe made mistakes, but in virtually all cases we know what the mistake was and we can correct it by comparing it with other documents. Now you might say, why wouldn't God just, if this is true, why wouldn't he just maintain the original? I'm speculating here, but I think one reason, well, two reasons. Number one, if we had the original, we might venerate it. We tend to venerate things like that, right? But number two, if I had the original, what could I do to it? I could alter it, right? But if you had a copy, 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 and I had a copy, and I changed my copy, is everyone going to know who changed their copy? Yeah, because when you get all your copies together and compare it to mine, you go, Turk, you heretic, why'd you do that? Right? So by not preserving the original, you actually are able to preserve the original better. So what if the error is not that simple? Like, what if it's a, it's a, a difference in concept? Um, so if we have these copies and say copy one gets 12 copies, copy two gets 24 copies, and then you've got copy four that gets 400 copies, mm -hmm. but copy four is the incorrect copy, then how do we justify truth in that? As well as how do we justify the truth in Jesus' exact words when we didn't hear them ourselves? Okay, there is no significant doctrine, theological doctrine, that is affected by any variant. In, and who admits this? Bart Ehrman himself, okay? So Bart Ehrman, the great skeptic, admits that the New Testament documents are reliable. In fact, let me, let me show you a quote from him because this quote is very uh, right on the money. You know, he wrote the book Misquoting Jesus. I don't know if you've heard of this book. But in 2005, he wrote a book called Misquoting Jesus, a popular book uh, in which he tries to insinuate that we can't trust what the New Testament documents have said. Yet the very same year, 2005, he wrote an academic work. He updated an academic work with his mentor, Dr. Bruce Metzger from Princeton University. In fact, Metzger was the top manuscript scholar of the last century. And in that book, he agrees with Metzger that the New Testament documents are copied accurately. Now, why is he coming to two different conclusions the same year? Same evidence. The only thing I can speculate is when you say to the academic community something wrong, they'll correct you on it. But when you say something wrong to the lay community, they don't know any better in most cases. You can sell a lot of books when you say the New Testament documents aren't copied reliably. That gets you a review in the New York Times, that gets you on the Colbert Show, the Jon Stewart Show. You sell a lot of books. Right, what's that? A textbook to be studied. We're studying Ehrman now. You're studying Misquoting Jesus? Um, no, his textbook, um, the New Testament. Okay, well that one that he co-wrote with Metzger is actually good. But this one, <laughs> this one, now here's what he says. This is in the appendix of the paperback version, so this comes out a year or two later from the original Misquoting Jesus. He's interviewed, and in the interview, here's what he says. Check this out. This is a quote from the book, page 252. 
He says, Bruce Metzger is one of the great scholars of modern times, and I dedicated the book to him because he was both my inspiration for going into textual criticism and the person who trained me in the field. I have nothing but respect and admiration for him. And even though we may disagree on important religious questions, he is a firmly committed Christian and I am not. We are in complete agreement on, the number of, on a number of very important historical and textual questions. What are they in agreement on? If he and I were put into a room and asked to hammer out a consensus statement on what we think the original text of the New Testament probably looked like, there would be very few points of disagreement, maybe one or two dozen places out of many thousands. The position I argue for in misquoting Jesus does not actually stand at odds with Professor Metzger's position that the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. Well, why would you write misquoting Jesus then? Not you, but Bart Ehrman, right? Why is, I mean, the book maybe should be called Misquoting Ehrman because he doesn't even agree with himself. So it seems that even Ehrman, when, when push comes to shove, admits that we do have an accurate copy of the New Testament documents. Now, your second question is, how do we know verbatim what Jesus said? We might not know verbatim what he said because there are no quote marks in Greek, so we're not always sure exactly if it's a quote or if it is a paraphrase, because Jesus probably spoke in Aramaic, yet the documents are written in Greek. But that's okay. You can communicate truth in, in different languages, and you don't have to be exact with what he said. You can get the gist of it. In fact, Jesus said he was an itinerant preacher. He probably gave the same talks in several different places, right? I mean, if you followed me around, I go around to different campuses. I give the same presentations over and over again. But I might say things slightly differently in one place than another place. So maybe one guy heard it one way, another guy heard it another way. We have the gist of what Jesus said. And that's really all God wanted to uh, tell us. Also, uh, you might imagine that at those times, people had highly developed memories. They could memorize complete books. We can't even remember our phone number because <laughs> we have all these devices that remember it all for us. So these people were an oral culture, and they memorized things quite well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grace. What is kind of being addressed here is what I refer to as the fallacy of every single word in the exact order and exactly as it was stated, or else none of it is true. And it's clear that God's desire is to communicate an accurate meaning to us, not just mechanically precise words. Think about it. There are four Gospels. This is just one example. But with each, there's slightly different variations of Jesus's words. With each, there's slightly different emphasis and perspective and different personality of the author. It's exactly what you would expect if it were recorded by real people, a real doctor, a fisherman, a tax collector. They're going to focus on different things, and these variations actually help us capture the meaning intended. If each gospel perfectly parroted the others, that would actually be a mark against the originality and the authenticity. So it's clear that God is comfortable letting the mechanism breathe, knowing that the meaning would still shine through. Second, I want to make it clear that Dr. Turek was using those four copies in his PowerPoint as a simple illustration, but in reality, there are thousands of copies that we have today, making this point all the more dramatic. In fact, check out this chart of the New Testament documents compared to everything else in antiquity. I'm going to go ahead and leave this chart on the screen for a second just for you to review and analyze. And with that being said, I'll see you guys in the next video.